All right, guys, looking at chapter six, functions. We've been using functions since, you know, the first week practically. So there's not a lot that we're going to see in here that's new. And the stuff that is new, like this, is not really anything that I consider important. It'd be more important if you were pursuing a, a computer science degree, right? You know, and going on to four-year college or something like that. But I don't think it's that important for us to understand. When you sit down and write a Python program, you do not normally do it as a recursive function. So what is a recursive function? A recursive function is a function that calls itself. Let's take a look at one. The first thing I'm going to do is write a recursive function that doesn't work right. Right? Just to illustrate. Um, so I'm going to call it recurse. Right? And all it's going to do is print hi, right? And then call itself, right? And then down in main or whatever, you call recurse, and it happens. Well, what happens is that it calls itself endlessly. But it's not really going to be endless. It's not going to be an infinite loop because it will crash at a certain point. If I minimize the window and then bring it back up, maybe just try to speed things up. You know, doesn't seem to be wanting to come back to where I can find it easily. Come on. There we go, right? It crashed because it used up all of its available memory. Not all the memory the computer has, but all the available that was, all the memory that was allocated for Python to run in. Why? Because each time you call a function, it has to allocate a little bit of memory. And when it exits that function, like if there was a return statement of something, it releases that memory. But we never got to a return statement, did we? So it kept allocating more and more memory each time it went into it, right? It would call it, come up here, print high, and then it would call itself, and it would keep doing that, and each time it entered the function, it would use up more memory and never release it. Okay, so that's a bad idea, right? There's no way for this function to exit. So it runs until Python runs out of memory. Very bad function. That's what you're trying to avoid. So we're not going to do that, right? But we're going to make another function. Recursive summation, right? We're going to take a number and we're going to calculate the summation of it, right? So if you pass in 10, it's going to add 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5. Right, just like that, right? Well, what are we going to do? Let's test it out. Let's say that x is equal to the recursive sum of 10, because I happen to know that that's 55. Let's write it. So what are we going to do? We're going to create a variable called total. Let me think about how we're going to do this. Just a second. I need to pause while I ponder. All right, actually, I think I remember what we're going to do. We're going to check to see if n is greater than 0. Right, because if it's less than zero, then we're done figuring out the recursion, right? This summation only works for positive numbers. I think that's a fair thing to say. So if n is less than one, return zero, right? Or if n is equal to zero, return zero, but we're just not going to allow negative numbers. Whoops, I put that in the wrong place. I was supposed to go after the doc screen, was it not? 
Okay. Else. Return. N. Plus. The recursive sum. Of N minus 1. See what this is doing? There's two ways out of it. So hopefully it's not going to be an infinite loop. This is called the recursive case. The recursive case is when it calls itself. Right? Every recursive function has to have two cases for it to successfully work. It has to have a recursive case, recursive case that does call itself and a non-recursive case, default case, that doesn't call itself. That's what was wrong with this one. It only had a recursive case, right? It always recursed. This one recurses until it gets down to zero. So if you pass in 10, it's going to say return 10 plus, and then it's going to call itself with 9, right? And then it's going to loop in here and say return 9 plus recursive n minus 1, which is 8, right? And so it's going to get in here and say return 8 plus, and you see, 7 plus, 6 plus, 5 plus, 4 plus, 3 plus, 2 plus, 1 plus, and then at this point, it's passing in 0, right? Because 1 minus 1 is 0, and it gets to if n is less than 1, then return 0, and the chain of calls is done. So it can actually finally get back to here. Let's make sure it works. All right, yeah, that was the expected. You know, if you press the N exclamation point on your key and you type in 55 and hit N exclamation point or whatever on your, on your fancy calculator, you would get 55, right? Is that true or is that factorial? I don't remember. Anyways, you could write a factorial just the same way if you wanted to, except it would be N times N minus 1, right? So that's recursive. Recursion is when a function calls itself. Every function, every recursive function, must have a recursive case where it does call itself and a default case where it doesn't Because if there's only a recursive case, it will call itself endlessly until it runs out of stack, until it runs out of memory. So that's recursion. I don't think we need to give any other examples. You can read about it in the text if you're interested in it, and it is worth in or it is worth thinking about. It's used for sorting algorithms, advanced sorting algorithms. It's used to solve a wide category of problems, and as an element of functional programming, which is kind of different than the imperative programming which we have been using. One of the ideas behind functional programming is that absolutely everything is a function, and you try to minimize the use of so-called state information or variables and one of the ways you can do that is via recursive functions anyways I want to move on from that topic let's look at the PowerPoint a little bit so what is a function it's a named block of code they say it a little bit differently package is an algorithm and a chunk of code that you can call by name okay it's a named block of code a function can be called from anywhere in a program's code, including code within other functions. And a function can receive data from its caller via arguments. Right? This is familiar stuff. Define hello, and it's going to take a first name and a last name, and it's going to print hello, comma, and haven't done our formatted print statements recently. Hello, comma, curly brace, if in, in curly brace, curly brace, ln, right? Like that. And it doesn't even need a return statement because as soon as it hits an unindented line of code, 
it automatically returns. All right, but anyways, we can call hello. Good old Bob Roberts. We need to say hi to him. And say hello to Malibu Barbie, right? And so on. That ought to look pretty dang familiar. Yep, and it printed them out. Okay. So this is a case of a function that doesn't return anything, but you can write a function that does return something, right? Like add, and it takes a1 and a2, right? And it re the result is a1 plus a2, right? And it returns that result. Like that. So you could say x is equal to add 10 comma 20. Right? Pretty evident what that does, right? 10 gets copied at a1, 20 gets copied at a2, right? So a1 and a2 are parameter variables. Usually you just call them parameters for short, right? And 10 and 20 are arguments that fill the parameter variables. And you also have things known as named parameter, named variables. And those are variables with default values. Like what if I wrote another function, and I think I've given you this example actually. Hello to, or let's call this one howdy, right? And it takes a first name. And then it takes a last name. And then, what are we going to do? Well, if they don't pass in anything, we're just going to say hello or howdy, right? But if they do pass in something, then we want to print howdy followed by whatever name they pass in, right? So, if fn plus ln, if the length of those two things together, right, fn plus ln is equal to zero, and I'm kind of winging this here, um, doing it a little bit differently than we did the last time, then all we have to do is print Howdy, partner. Right like that. Else, we're going to print howdy, comma, fn plus. Yeah, I'm kind of botching this. Kind of botching how we want to do this. And the reason why is I don't want to put a space if there's only fn or ln. But if there is fn or ln, then I want to put a space between them. And I'm not coming up with a quick, elegant way of doing that. Tell you what, we're going to make this from, for boys, for, for men. And if there is a last name, but no first name, we're going to just call them Mr., right? So let's start making a string that we're going to print out, right? And so if there's absolutely nothing, we're just going to say that the string is equal to partner, right? Else, elif, the length of first name is greater than zero and the length of last name is equal to zero then that means that all we have is their first name right are we still gonna call them mister in that case Nah, we're gonna be friendly right and if somebody tells us their first name then we're gonna greet them by their first name right so s is equal to first name else that means we have their e l if the length of the last name is greater than zero
and the length of the first name is equal to zero, right? In that case, the string is equal to Mr. in quote plus the last name, right? That was supposed to be elif. Followed by the final case is we have both a first name and a last name, right? And so s is equal to the first name plus a space plus a last name, right? And now maybe we could make this a little bit more generic, right? By allowing ourselves to pass in an honorific, right? Either the Mr. or the Mrs. Right, so we're going to allow themselves to take a first name in, a last name in, and an honorific. And so that would be here, right? The honorific. I think I actually kind of liked it the way it was. I'm going to undo that change because I'm getting a little bit beyond the point. All right. And then we can say hello, right? Print parentheses F quote howdy comma curly brace string exclamation mark end quote in braces, right? So if, if the first name is zero and the last name is zero then we just print partner. Howdy, partner. But if there's a first name and no last name, right? Then we just say hi by their first name. Greet them by first name. If there's a last name but no first name, right? Then we greet them by Mr. followed by their last name. And lastly, in all other cases, we greet them by their full name. Now maybe that's a silly case, but the deal is, is that if we want to, we could do this. We could call howdy, right? Howdy, mister, and just, that will say partner. Or we could give it a first name, right? Text, right? Or we could say, howdy, Mr., you know, Bob Clampett. I guess I'm going on a Warner Brothers cartoon animator. Text, Bob Clampett. Alrighty. Excuse me, sorry. But what if you only wanted to specify the last name? Well, since it's got a name here, we could do that, right? We could say, howdy, comma, Mr., and we can say the last name is equal to clamp it, right? And in that case, it'll say Mr. Clamp it. Hope that makes sense. Or not, because I probably have a tab missing or something like that. That was supposed to be DEF, not DEL. Right? And so called with no arguments, it says howdy partner. Called with one argument, it says howdy text. Called with two arguments, it greets them by their first and their last name. And if called with only a last name, it calls them Mr. Clampett. Right? That makes sense? That's how things like this work, right? Print, you know, um, hi, comma, file equals, you know, whatever operator, whatever file we had defined, end equals, you know, and we don't want to end in a new line, so we specify that. So file and end are optional named parameters with default values. We can see that if we go back to the shell 
we type in dir print, right? Second thought, I'm not seeing what I want to see there. But if we do help print, oh, seems to be a lot more useful. Then here are the optional arguments. Separator, EEMD, and file, and flush. What does flush do? We can read these. Whether to forcibly flush the stream, meaning that it absolutely has to be committed to file, right? As soon as you write it out. And the string is appended after the last value. The default is a new line, right? So if you don't specify an end argument, it just goes in the next line when it's done. The separator is the string that's inserted between values, right? So we could do print, you know, one comma two comma three comma the separator is equal to and a right, and it's going to print one and a two and a three. I may have given that example already. I know that we already know how to use functions. So we're going to move on to talking about classes pretty soon, right? So the separator is one and a two and a three. I guess I could have specified the first name as well, right? Howdy, Mr. And the last name is equal to, you know, um, Wayne. And the first name is equal to John. Call them out of order. Sure, you can do that, right? Because the variables have names. The parameters have names, so we can call them just like that. As a matter of fact, you can do that even if they don't have default values. But you'd better provide all of them if there aren't any default values. So like if you wanted to write a function that would calculate the value of, you know, two numbers, a numerator and a denominator, right? X over Y, define, uh, define, get quotient, right, of the numerator as opposed to the denominator. And it's going to return. So the result is equal to the numerator divided by the denominator. And then return the result. Why is it giving me grief about the tabs? I'm not seeing it yet. I must have some problem going on. Because every time I hit enter or tabbed it an extra tab, I'm not getting why. EOL while scanning string literal. That means I have an open quote and no close quote. Right there, right? So if we were going to write what this prints, this prints howdy partner. This prints howdy text. This prints howdy Bob Clampett. This prints howdy Mr. Clampett. And this prints Howdy John Wayne. Oh, come on. Okay. One more. All righty. Very good. Let me put some extra spaces here to see if it makes it easier to read because we have a lot of comments kind of cluttering up the screen. Comments are great, but sometimes they make the code more difficult to read. And like I said, you can stick a return statement at the end of a function, even if it's not returning a value, it's mandatory if it is returning a value, right? But it's kind of nice just to see it. Okay, so we're going to call get quotient, right? X is equal to get quotient.
All right, I'm going to change these names. The thing being divided is called the dividend, and the thing doing the dividing is called the divisor. What is it, E on? I think it's OR. Yep, it's OR. All right. And so when we call it, we're going to get the quotient of the divisor is equal to 2 and the dividend equals 1, right? Which is just the same thing as 1 over 2. So x, x had better equal 1 half by the time we're done here, right? Apparently I have a missing quote again. Print x, right? So it's just going to print 0 0.5 if we're correct. Um, here we go. Now I'm missing a closed parenthesis. That was botched. I didn't make the correct fix there. All right. Now my tabs will stop complaining. Here we go. Go ahead and run it. Ooh, get quotient is not defined. Well, it'd help if I had not misspelled it. Little syntax errors. There we go. Invalid keyboard. Well, see, I'm being sloppy. A type is dividend. No. Dividend. Right. Maybe I should have just called it top and bottom. Right. Oh, and here I called it numerate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to call it top and bottom. Make some changes here. And it's going to make sense. Right. And that works, right? Or we could have called it without using the names, just like you would normally do. 1 over 2, right? Which is still 1 over 2. All right, so I seem to have botched it because I made the top two and the bottom one, but I wanted to reverse the order. So bottom is equal to two, top is equal to one, All right? That makes sense. I'm just specifying out of order the operators for my function, All right? Just because it wanted me to pass in one comma two, I can change my mind and pass in a two first and a one first if I use the parameter names. And that is about enough of that. You can also use named parameters, right? If you were going to write a function called mult, which allowed you to return, you know, numbers multiplied by each other, well, what if you wanted to write it like this? And wait, no, you don't give it a type. A1, comma, A2 is equal to 1, A3 is equal to 1, a4 is equal to 1, A5 is equal to 1, right? That ought to be about enough. Multiply five numbers by each other, or 4, or 3, or 2, or 1, right? So the result is equal to A1 times A2 times A3 times A4 times A5, right? But since we've given them default values, the only one that's mandatory is to pass in one value, right? Because what would it mean if you passed in mult and you only gave it one term? I mean, no terms. Maybe we should make it mandatory for them to pass in two. But then beyond that, right, they all default to one. So if they pass in a two and a three, then we're going to do two times three, which is six, times one times one times one. But if they pass in two, three, four, and five, well, two times three is six, times four is 24, times five is whatever that is, right? So... Then we can do that, right? A is equal to mult of 2 comma 3. B is equal to mult 2 comma 3 comma 4, which ought to be 24, right? C is equal to mult of 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, right? That's the largest set of the work because we have five parameters here, so we can use only five arguments here. And 2 times 3 is 6 times 5 is 30, times 4 is 125. If I've figured that out correctly, and we print out A, B, and C, then we will see 6, 24, and 120. 
think. Why not? Or none, none, none. What did I do wrong? I calculated the result, but I did not return a value, just like I have this. And if you don't return anything, then the variable that stores the result just gets the word none. That's all it sees. So we better actually return the variable that we want, right? We calculated the return value, so we better return the result. Right? 624.120. So, default arguments are used when a function needs to accept arguments sometimes, but if they aren't provided, then a default value is used. Example, set file and end on a print statement. Let's uh, remember that open command that we used to open files to save to. Let's go do a help on the open command. See if there are any default arguments in it. That's a long one. All right. See, it's got a default mode called R. Excuse me, it's got a default argument called mode, but if you don't specify it, opens it for reading. It's got a default argument called buffering, but if you don't specify it, it says buffering negative one. You could scroll down and figure out what that means. It's got a default variable called, in, excuse me, it's got a uh, parameter called encoding, but if you don't specify a value, then encoding is none. Same for errors, same for new line, right? If you don't specify a new line, then none is specified, and it goes ahead and adds a new line. No, that, that's not what new line means, because we're talking about open. But anyways, you could read what each one of those defaults, and excuse me, what each one of those parameters does. But so when you call open, you could specify the mode, you could specify the encoding, you could specify the new line, but you don't have to, right? All you absolutely have to pass in is that. And it'll work just fine if all you're reading is a read file, right? If you're opening it only for reading and you're not customizing any of the other behavior. In the mult function above, the first two parameters must be filled by arguments. The A3, A4, and A5 are optional and will default to 1 if not provided. How about we cut this and move it below, above that? And then we'll say in the multi function below. All right. Now we know everything we need to know about functions. Yeah, it's not quite true, but I think it's what I want to cover, right? Functions as abstraction mechanism. An abstraction hides detail. You don't need to know how the open function works, right? You don't need to know what goes on behind the scenes in order for it to open a file. It's abstract, right? All we want to do is open a file. We don't care about how it does it. Same for printing. We don't need to see the underlying machine code or whatever that causes letters to appear on the screen. And so here's a summation argument, excuse me, a summation function written to accept a lower and upper bounds. And so if you pass in summation of 1, 4, it prints a summation of 10, right? And the summation of 50 to 100, it calculates that, right? So when you call summation, you don't need to know the details of how that happens, right? There's lots of math, math functions that we have no idea, really. I mean, there are formulas for it, but I would have no idea how to calculate the arc tangent of, you know, negative two or, you know, <laughs> whatever. Or how to, con you know, 
I would not know how to do all that math stuff without looking it up. And even then, it's probably all done with loops and stuff that it's already been written for you. So you don't need to know how to do it. This summation function now has been written for me. And so if I wanted to just copy it and use it without caring, as long as I tested it a few times and make sure it works, then I could use it. And from then on, I don't have to worry about how it used. It's called abstraction. right? Abstraction is making a function, you know, that can embody a concept and you don't need to know the details. So it hides complexity, right? You don't need to know how my multi feature work feature works. You don't need to know how the open feature works. It hides the complexity. Functions support the division of labor. You might have a function that opens a file. You might have another function that's the for loop for processing the file. And you might have a function for closing the file or for displaying the results. So top-down design starts with a global view of the problem and breaks it down. That's a process known as problem decomposition. As each subproblem is isolated, its solution is assigned to a function. And then there's a structure chart. The idea behind a structure chart, we covered that in Fundamentals 1113, but the idea is main is going to call a function called count sentences. And we also know that main is going to call a function called count words. And it calls something called count syllables. It has something called count syllables, which calls another function called syllables ln. Right? So you can have functions that call functions, and you can have functions that call functions that call functions. Or functions that call functions that call functions, right? And it could be that this particular function needs to be called on multiple functions. That's five, right? You can have multiple functions in your program that call the print statement. Totally fine. All righty. Here's another uh, chart, structure chart. Main calls sentence, and it has noun phrases and verb phrases and prepositional phrases, and I don't really feel like looking into that too closely. A recursive function is one that calls itself. What I was calling the default case, they're calling the base case, so I need to go back and modify my documentation up here. So every recursive function must have a recursive case where it does call itself and a base case, right, where it does not. So this is the base case when we just return a value rather than calling ourselves. And this is the recursive case. Hope that makes sense. All right, I want to talk about classes now. I want to stop talking about functions because we pretty much know how to write functions already. We've just talked about a couple of fine points, right? The fine points being that you can give some optional values default values for, for parameters, right? And you can name your parameters as you call them, if you so choose. Especially useful if they're optional, right? If a function has five or six optional parameters, it makes an awful lot of sense to be able to name them so that you only pass in the information that is necessary. Alright, so what is a class? What is an object? Way back in the beginning, we used the turtle library, right? We had import turtle, and we did t is equal to turtle dot turtle. I'm going to wind up commenting this out, right? And then we did turtle dot forward or fd 100 pixels, and turtle dot left 90 degrees. And then we did another turtle dot forward 100 pixels, right? And we did turn right by 45 degrees, right? And then turtle dot forward by 100 more pixels, right? And it's going to draw a little picture. And 
And there it is, right? Turn left, then it turned right. And it had speed parameters, so if you wanted it to draw it really closely, you could do so. T.speed is equal to 1. So now it should run more slowly. Still run pretty fast, all things considered. Okay. And so on. Right? So what are these things? These dots. These are functions that are attached to a class. To attach to a variable. I have an object, a variable, t, and then attached to that are some functions. And here's a variable that's attached to that variable. This is object-oriented programming. So for example, we could write a function and the, excuse me, a class. And the way you define a class is with the keyword class. So I'm going to call this report because we're going to print a report, right? And it's going to have an init function. And just take it on, on faith that we have to do it like this. And then so if we call the intro function, def intro, right? Then it prints the introduction. And then if we call the body function, right? It prints this is the body. Turns. And then we could call the close, right? Which prints this is the closing, right? And returns. So now we're going to create a report, right? Report R equals, excuse me, sorry, I slipped in the Java or C++ there, R is equal to report, right? That creates a report, and we can call r.header, or excuse me, r.intro, right? Let's say that we like that intro so much, we want to see it repeated. And then we're going to call it r.body, and then we're going to call r.close. And so since we called intro twice, it's going to print this as the introduction twice. Maybe we should only call that once, but we should print the body twice, right? So r.body. Our paper is so good that we want to repeat the body of it twice. All right? And so it's going to print this is the introduction, this is the body, and this is the closing. I'm going to go ahead and comment this out because I don't want it to draw the picture every single time. But in this example, turtle is the class. t equals turtle dot turtle creates the turtle object and stores it in the t variable and t dot forward calls the fd function which is defined as part of the turtle class a function that's defined as part of a class a function that is attached to a class defined within a class has a technical name of method. It's called a method. So here we have actually four methods. It's got an init method which is called just when it is being created. Right? We could stick a print statement there too, right? print. Okay. Report is being created. Right? Just like that. So now I'm going to run it. Oops. You always have to have that self keyword as the first argument. Just accept that on faith. 
And if you wind up doing more class programming in in Python, you can start to research what it means. Read the uh, the textbook a little more, more carefully about it. And if you ever take Java or C++, then this is the same thing as the so-called this parameter, T-H-I-S parameter. Okay. So we're going to give a better example in a minute, but when this runs, it should print. This is the introduction. This is the body. This is the body. And this is the closing. Right? And that's what it did. So the above class has four methods. Init, which is called when the object is being created. And intro, body, and close. Every method needs to have the self parameter parameter defined as the first argument as shown above. Now we wrote one that doesn't have any other arguments, right? That's okay. So we're going to write a function called rectangle. DEF, re excuse me, we're going to write a class called rectangle, right? And what does a re rectangle have? It has a height and a width. So we're going to define an init function, right? And it's going to set self.height equal to zero and self.width equal to zero. Or maybe we should set them to one, right, or something. But anyways, after you create your rectangle, right, r is equal to rectangle, you could set height and width, right? r.height is equal to 10 and r.width is equal to 20. Because these variables are defined as being part of the class. And how are they being defined as part of the class? Because they are created inside the init method. The init, the init method creates variables that are attached to the object, right? These are called member variables. Some people call them fields, some people call them properties, I forget what the textbook calls them, but we can set them like that. But wouldn't it have been neat if we could do it like this, right? R is equal to, well, I guess I misspelled rectangle then. Rectangle 2 comma 3. Wouldn't that have been cooler, right? Or 10 comma 20. That would have been cooler. Then we wouldn't have had to follow it up with those two statements. Well, we could do that as well. I'm going to make a class called rectangle 2, right? So that it supports that. Class rectangle 2. DF init. And it takes a height and a width, right? And so when we call it, we are setting self.height equals to the height that's passed in. Or, you know, if we want to abbreviate, that's fine. And then self.width is equal to the width that's passed in. Right? Now, why are we creating this rectangle class? Well, you know, we might want some functions. Some functions like get area and get perimeter. Let's do that. Define get area. Has to take self. They always do. And why are we doing this? So we can do something like this. Area is equal to r.get area. And then we could print it out. Right? print the area of the rectangle is comma area. How do you calculate the area? It's just width times height, isn't it? Result is equal to self dot height times self dot width. And then return that result. So the member variables will be used in other methods in the class, right? 
So what is it? What is a class? I'm going to give my definition for it. A class is the blueprint for objects that contain data and have methods, which are functions, right, that use that data. So we have variables, right, member variables, and we have functions, and we have methods that use that data. Right? So in the above example, This, the rectangle classes track the data height and width, right? And that data is used by the get area and get perimeter methods. Now we didn't write a get perimeter, but we can. Let's go up here and do that, right? Define get perimeter cell. And the formula for the perimeter is just height plus width plus height plus width, or two times height plus width. It's the fastest way to do it. Result is equal to two plus, excuse me, two times self dot height plus self dot width. Right, because you got to go up, over, down, over again. Right, so self plus height plus self dot width. That's the perimeter of it. Turn result. And the area of that is equal, excuse me, so the perimeter of that equals r dot get parameter. Like that. And so the area of the rectangle is that and the and the perimeter of the rectangle. is that. Now I'm just going to copy these two functions and put them into here. We should be using an idea called inheritance, which is a more technical thing. And you can read about it in the textbook if you want, in order to inherit these functions, these methods, from the other rectangle class. But I think that's OK. I think we've done it all right. So I'm going to say R2 is equal to rectangle 2 and then print out this kind of stuff, right? So the area is equal to R2, get dot get area. The perimeter is equal to R2 dot get perimeter. And the area of rectangle R2 is that, and the er perimeter of rectangle R2 is that. Which will be the same, right? Because this is a 10 by 20, and this is a 10 by 20. So, we wrote the init function, the init method of the rectangle 2 class to accept two arguments for height and width. So we could do r2 equals rectangle 2 comma 20 rather than it be necessary to create the rectangle and then set the height and the width in separate calls as shown in the call or in the lines after r equals rectangle where we said r dot height equals 10 and r dot width equals 20. All right, hope that makes sense. Hope that makes sense. If you take a look at this again, it makes sense, I hope. This is the class name, which you put here. This is the init function, and you can define parameters inside the init function to fill in variables. 
H and W are parameters that are used to fill the height and width member variables. Right? That's what that is. Get area returns in the area of the square. Perimeter, perimeter, get parameter returns a perimeter. Alrighty, I hope that makes sense. You can talk an awful lot about classes, and I wouldn't mind talking a little bit more, but I think this is enough to complete today's lectures. So let's go ahead and stop. I'm not going to be doing any homework because I want you to be working on your projects.